Um, what I would like to send is two crazy guys created a mess in a beautiful country. So that could be the topic because those two crazy guys have destroyed the country that had everything. That was 20 or 30 years in advance of Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, and um, placed us that today we have to ask two times to join the European Union. Even um, we should remember, or there's at least a much, uh, let's say, experienced gentleman who told me that 1974 Tito was offered to join the European Economic Union. So at that point of time, we haven't had the European Union. But 1974, Yugoslavia was asked to join European Economic Union, EEU, uh, and today we are still waiting to be a part of Europe. But the basic message is two crazy guys created a mess. A mess. I believe very much that we are able, all the, let's say, countries that came from Yugoslavia are able to develop themselves further, and there is the biggest responsibility is on politicians. Yeah. Uh, I, I agree with you. We had a lot of missed opportunities with Yugoslavia. I once also participated in another opportunity. Uh, we offered from the EFTA side a credit uh, of 100 million. It was actually a grant uh, uh, for infrastructure in Yugoslavia. Uh, we then negotiated for more than eight years. I never understood why we negotiated so long. I think basically the then uh, negotiating team always wanted to go to Geneva before Christmas for shopping. So, <laughs> Makes it, I, it makes sense, but I was deeply disappointed because this was uh, money offered to uh, Yugoslavia, which was never called up. So we, all those invitations for dance, like you call it, and we, we did it again, uh, passed and used. Uh, previously, Yugoslavia was more interested uh, in the group of 77 than in the uh, European integration. I'm very happy that these are uh, historic times and we start a new relation now. Thank you. I'd like to ask you about your opinion uh, of the EU at large, not the dates, not the, the timeline and everything, but just your uh, view on... Um, okay, uh, so just your view on the fact, is, is EU tired of newcomers? How is the Bulgarian and Romanian example reflecting on others coming to join the EU? Because there are things that EU, I guess, learned from, from accession of EU uh, to EU of Romania and Bulgaria. And finally, uh, are there diff what are the differences between the countries? EU, of course, is a, is a union, but every country has a slightly different view. If you look at the example of Austria, not only economically, but also politically, the influence that, that it has in the Eastern Europe in general. And maybe some countries like France don't have this type of, uh, uh, of uh, opinion or Spain, for example, on others. So I might have posted a couple of questions, but yeah. yeah. Um, when Austria I wanted to join uh, the membership, and I was the one who were all the time over certain years in the membership <coughs> negotiation with the European Union, I still remember that uh, Tim Bergen, um, Belgian politician, said Austria should never, will never join uh, the European Union because Austria is a neutral country and we don't want neutral countries uh, among uh, the group of, of six. So it's always difficult to join. If you join, you always must do the uphill battle. Uh, Austria, for example, we applied for an association agreement way back in 61, it was at the time from Kreisky. And we only got this association together with the European Economic Area Agreement in 94, one year uh, before joining. You see how long it takes to negotiate. But I think it's all about you, like joining, you know, a complicated family. It is a complicated family. You must do the efforts. Uh, you must do all the love declaration to the European Union. At the end, you will succeed. Once you're in, you will see life is much easier. Uh, than uh, always making marriage proposals. Huh? Yeah. Um, so the European Union, all right, is tired. Well, you see, um, if you look, uh, it is much more complex to have the European Union with 27 than with 6. But those who are the founding fathers of the six member states know that this entity would be today so small that nobody would talk to this 
small group. So because the European Union has now 600 million, uh, 500 million uh, population, it is more important now. Uh, again, uh, but again, it's losing in the world stage. But still, together with the United States, is around 80 percent of all the norms are actually created by the European Union and the United States and then enforced through the UN system. So it is still powerful, but much more powerful than you would have the population. This will go down. So everybody knows that if we don't enlarge, the importance of the European Union will go down, it will be more complex, and we have to again to make sure that the machinery still functions in Brussels, so we must really abolish unanimous decisions, so nobody can really block things. Uh, so again, we need another deepening, which we will do, we will have less commissioners, so we will be in a rotating, but basically I'm confident that all the Balkan area will join because the European Union you know, has made a quite a lot of effort, not only financially, but also even the soldiers down to keep peace. And the European Union has done something in the Balkan area which the United States doesn't have. The United States has a good hard power, but the European Union has a soft power. You know, the development experts, huh? uh, the Rajon de Bari, National, and all of this to keep a peaceful development. Basically, it, it works. So I think um, all the investment uh, emotionally in the Balkan should now carry on. So I just want to encourage you, go ahead. Thank you. This is Sepp Stevich, I'm a student for the School of uh, Electrical Engineering in Belgrade. Uh, what do actually do you see as the biggest boundary for Serbia to join the EU and how should, how should we solve it? No, the, the, the biggest, uh, the, you know, Serbia has advantages and disadvantages. One of the biggest advantages is that Serbia is in the center of ex Yugoslavia, you are on the Danube area, and the bridge of Novi Sad. I was rebuilt, uh, I know it exactly because I was also in charge of this problem. Only two, huh? only two out of three. Out of three, okay. <laughs> we, we, we used the old plans. Now, um, the disadvantage is the history. Nadish, uh, Milosevic, uh, and all of this. So, you really, you, you must cut the history of the past and try uh, to get clear with the dark shadows of history, as I would like to call them. Uh, so these are problems, but I think the younger generation is able to do it, and this is the reason why you get this kind of encouragement from all your friends, uh, and among also uh, Austria, that we will help you uh, in your uh, negotiations. I was personally in Belgrade on a seminar in the Diplomatic Academy of the Seven Foreign Ministry last floor there to really to help to teach the negotiating techniques in Brussels, which is a very difficult thing. Okay. Maybe one final question have to be one question, and then we go in the Serbia session. Maybe after the Serbia session, we take the other question. Thank you. Uh, my name is Michael Neumeyer. I'm from Graz. Uh, don't get me wrong. I'm, uh, I'm supporting that uh, Southeastern Europe should be part of the European Union, but there is still a question. There are there are seven countries. Uh, fighting several horrible wars just a decade ago and uh, now they want to become now they want to reunite within the European Union again uh, how do you communicate this with the population and uh, couldn't that be a threat for the stability of the European Union um, I think you have to go back to the history of the European Union uh, it started all after the Second World War a war between Germany and France and they all said never have a war again. They wanted to make a European army, which didn't work. Then they made the coal and steel community. And the coal and steel community was actually nothing other than they put all the coal production and the steel production uh, in a joint administration to prevent that not either uh, France could not rearm nor Germany without the others knowing it. So the whole beginning of the European integration was no was again. It worked. It worked. Um, it, perhaps it was uh, stupid because we had the coal uh, was really produced.
is too much coal, and they have to close down the coal, they have to go into social uh, network, uh, social uh, programs for the uh, coal and steel workers. But this system works, and I'm quite optimistic that these links uh, will also work to prevent the bad memories uh, in ex Yugoslavia. We have to do much more, we have to do the uh, training, the school children, uh, and human rights, and all of this. So it will take quite a long time. Uh, today, the Croatian said uh, we have a separate language, and the Serbs said we have a separate language. And when I was a student, I had to learn several Croatian as one language, Kruha Kleb, huh? No, again, I think um, we had, uh, they had a past a difficult time, and they are desperate, wanting to, to make it working, but not among themselves, but through the European Union. I think we have a great chance to help them. Thank you. There is definitely trouble, but there is also the need to overcome the trouble. Uh, if it's easy, uh, everybody can do it. But it's difficult, and within the European integration, we have learned techniques how to solve uh, problems. As I tried to uh, explain at the beginning, the problem between uh, the uh, French-speaking Belgium and the Flemish-speaking could also escalate in such a way, and basically it has been kept down. Huh? and it will be kept on more in the future. Thank you very much. Mr. Wojtek, thank you very much for this interesting talk and for your time and also for your participation instead of Dr. Busek, who is recovering at the moment, thankfully. And uh, he has to leave to Brussels today to help the Poland people for their membership uh, participation in the European program. So, good flight. Um, we want to s switch uh, panels now. We are going now directly in the uh, Serbia forum. And we have the panelists sitting here. Uh, we are starting with a talk from Zelko uh, Spasojevic, sitting on my left. So he will give you an introduction about the economic outlook, uh, which he put together with a team of students from the university here. Afterwards, we will get the uh, inputs from Bojan Jankovic, sitting on my left, who is the director of the Serbian Investment and Export Promotion Agency in Belgrade. And after him we get a talk from Branislav Bukarski, he's the CEO of the uh, Vojvodina Investment Promotion, Novi Sad. And uh, last but not least, we get a talk from uh, Grady Mikrovic, he's the head of Rumi Resource of the Global Academic for Serbia. And I'm looking forward now to an interesting panel. And afterwards, uh, I'm looking for your contributions and I think some of Today, this presentation, and hopefully, if it is not a one man show, and please feel free to interrupt uh, whenever you want and just ask questions. Now, what is the presentation about? We will go through these points. So, we will have some interview results we um, had during our research. Then, we will focus on Aus Austrian investors and some economic policy incentives. Now, we will answer the question why are these Austrian um, investors investing in Serbia and what are the incentives. And then we will have some um, industry research. We show some, some industries. We will focus on automotive and energy and we will just go quickly through them. But afterwards we will be able to connect Austrian investors with some very attractive industries in Serbia. And of course there is a balance. So at the end we will also show that we are neutral, so there are also industries which probably are not so interesting in our point of view. So these are four, four um, issues we went through the interviews, you don't have to go through these points. But the conclusion out of the interviews, uh, we had some positive and some negative one. So we have already many Austrian investors in Serbia, but no one could 